Chapter 3, Part 1 As we attempt to analyze dialogue as a human phenomenon, we discover something which is the essence of dialogue itself, the word. But the word is more than just an instrument which makes dialogue possible. Accordingly, we must seek its constitutive elements. Within the word, we find two dimensions, reflection and action. In such radical interaction that if one is sacrificed, even in part, the other immediately suffers. There is no true word that is not at the same time a praxis. Thus, to speak a true word is to tr transform the world. An unauthentic word, one which is unable to transform reality, results when dichotomy is imposed upon its constitutive elements. When a word is deprived of its dimension of action, reflection automatically suffers as well, and the word is changed into idle chatter into verbalism, into an alienated and alienating blah. It becomes an empty word, one which cannot denounce the world, for denunciation is impossible without a commitment to transform, and there is no transformation without action. On the other hand, if action is emphasized exclusively to the detriment of reflection, the word is converted into activism. The latter action for action's sake, negates the true praxis and makes dialogue impossible. Either dichotomy, by creating unauthentic forms of existence, creates also unauthentic forms of thought, which reinforce the original dichotomy. Human existence cannot be silent, nor can it be nourished by false words, but only by true words with which men and women transform the world. To exist, humanly, is to name the world, to change it. Once named, the world in its turn reappears to the namers as a problem and requires of them a new naming. Human beings are not built in silence, but in word, in work, in action, reflection. But while to say the true word, which is work, which is praxis, is to transform the world, saying that word is not the privilege of some few persons, but the right of everyone. Consequently, no one can say a true word alone, nor can she say it for another, in a prescriptive act which robs others of their words. Dialogue is the encounter between men mediated by the world in order to name the world. Hence, Dialogue cannot occur between those who want to name the world and those who, not, who do not wish this naming, between those who deny others the right to speak their word and those whose right to speak has been denied them. Those who have been denied their primordial right to speak their word must first reclaim this right and prevent the continuation of this dehumanizing aggression. If it is in speaking their word that people, by naming the world, transform it, dialogue imposes itself as the way by which they achieve significance as human beings. Dialogue is thus an existential necessity, and since dialogue is the encounter in which the united reflection and action of the dialoguers are addressed to the world, which is to be transformed and humanized, this dialogue cannot be reduced to the act of one person's depositing ideas in another, nor can it become a simple exchange of ideas to be consumed by the discussants. Nor yet is it a hostile, polemical argument between those who are committed neither to naming of the world, nor to the search of truth, but rather to the imposition of their own truth. Because dialogue is an encounter among women and men who name the world, it must not be a situation where some name on behalf of others. It is an act of creation. It must not serve as a crafty instrument for the domination of one person by another. The domination implicit in dialogue is that of the world by the dialoguers. It is the conquest of the world 
for the liberation of humankind. Dialogue cannot exist, however, in the absence of a profound love for the world and for people. The naming of the world, which is an act of creation and recreation, is not possible if it is not infused with love. Love is at the same time the foundation of dialogue and dialogue itself. It is thus necessarily the task of responsible subjects and cannot exist in a relation of domination. Domination reveals the pathology of love, sadism in the dominator and masochism in the dominated. Because love is an act of courage, not of fear, love is commitment to others. No matter where the oppressed are found, the act of love is commitment to their cause, the cause of liberation. And this commitment, because it is loving, is dialogical. As an act of bravery, love cannot be sentimental. As an act of freedom, it must not serve as a pretext for manipulation. It must generate other acts of freedom. Otherwise, it is not love. Only by abolishing the situation of oppression is it possible to restore the love which that situation made impossible. If I do not love the world, if I do not love life, if I do not love people, I cannot enter into dialogue. On the other hand, dialogue cannot exist without humility. The naming of the world, through which people constantly recreate that world, cannot be an act of arrogance. Dialogue as the encounter of those who addressed to that common task of learning and acting is broken if the parties, or one of them, lack humility. How can I dialogue if I always project ignorance onto others and never perceive my own? How can I dialogue if I regard myself as a case apart from others, mere its in whom I cannot recognize other eyes? How can I dialogue if I consider myself a member of the group of the in-group of pure men, the owners of truth and knowledge, for whom all non-members are these people or the great unwashed? How can I dialogue if I start from the premise that naming the world is the task of an elite and that the presence of the people in history is a sign of deterioration, thus to be avoided? How can I dialogue if I am closed to and even offended by the contribution of others? How can I dialogue if I am afraid of being displaced, the mere possibility causing me torment and weakness? Self-sufficiently is incompatible with dialogue. Men and women who lack humility or have lost it cannot come to the people, cannot, come, cannot be partners in naming the world. Someone who cannot acknowledge himself to be as mortal as everyone else still has a long way to go before he can reach the point of encounter. At the point of encounter, there are neither other utter ignorant there are neither utter ignoramuses nor perfect sages. There are only people who are attempting together to learn more than they know now. Dialogue further requires an intense faith in humankind, faith in their power to make and remake, to create and recreate, faith in their vocation to be more fully human, which is not the privilege of an elite, but the birthright of all. Faith in people is an a priori requirement for dialogue. The dialogical man believes in others even before he meets them face to face. His faith however, is not naive. The dialogical man is critical and knows that although it is within the power of humans to create and transform, in a concrete situation of alienation, individuals may be impaired in the use of that power. Far from destroying his faith in the people, however, this possibility strikes him as a challenge to which he must respond. He is convinced that the power to create and transform even when thwarted in concrete situations, tends to be reborn. 
end of part one.